God, we thank you that, that your love was so great. That there truly isn't any way for us to love in that agape style love that you'd have for us without you first loving us. And so we come this morning and we celebrate that love and we sing about that love and we resonate that love in our hearts. But God, if we, if we hold on to that love, keep it for ourselves and never share it with the world and our friends and family around us, then we're not really doing what you've called us to do. We're not just supposed to sit and soak we're supposed to learn and then use it out in the world and apply it to our lives and love the world like you love us. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hanging around in the rain Playing the same little game I'm only hoping to get to see you Looking around as if I had something I had to try When all I want to do is see you I'll say it was chance and ask you to dance and that will start our romance And after all I've been through Just to get close to you I know that you will love me too I'm not condoning poker playing. That's not what I was condoning by that video, right? <laughs> but isn't it true? Life is better. I know we set this up for, for Pastor Tracy, and, and now you have to adjust it for me. But that's all right. Hopefully no feedback. We'll be all right. But life is better when we're doing it with other people. God did not design us to be solitary human beings, that's why that one of the worst things that you can do for somebody in prison is put them in solitary confinement. Many men and women can't handle that, and it drives them crazy, and it's, it's one of the greatest forms of punishment that they use in, in prisons today at times because we are made to be with people. Do me a favor. Everybody pull out their phones, and no, I'm not going to tell you to put them on silence because hopefully you've already done that already. Pull out your phones. Hold them up. You leave your home, good. If you have your phone, hold it up for me, all right? Now, I want you to go and find in your phone your uh, pictures, whatever your picture library is. Mine is my iPhotos. Pull that thing up, all right? Now, I want you to look through your phone, and I want you to kind of make a rough estimate of how many selfies you have in your phone, all right? So... Oh, wait, 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 don't tell me yet. I want to give those other people that have some, and we're not embarrassing anybody here. I'm not going to ask you to call out, uh, or maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so just kind of look through, and how many selfies do you have? All right. Let's do it. Who has no, well, no, 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 I won't do that. Who has at least 10 selfies in there? Let's be honest. This is church, all right? All right? Who has probably at least 100 selfies in there? All right? Who has zero selfies in there? All right. Now, this isn't a time for us to pat us on the back. I mean, no, no big deal. But, but what it tells us, and I think you'd probably be able to look at the, the age di dynamic of that. Probably the younger generation is going to have more selfies than the older generation because it's a new phenomenon, even though some of us older people have got into it a little bit. But it, it is a young kind of thing. But it, it is a sign of our time, though, a little bit because... Because what is a selfie about? It's about you. I remember one time looking at, at a phone, and it probably had a strand of like a thousand. I mean, just like in a row, they were like, 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 look at this picture here. 
Well, I, it's up next, right here. Like, like this, I mean, come on. But, I mean, they're just doing this and doing this and making all kind of funny faces, and I'm not sure who that's for and what is the purpose of that. It is, it's just part of the culture that sometimes I, I shake my head. Maybe it's because I'm getting old and my hair is, hair is starting to turn gray and I'm not understanding the young culture, but it's, it's just, to me, a sign also of this, this self-indulging culture. Now, sometimes selfies are with more people, and I get that. But there are, there, there's this phenomenon that came out for a while that people were just taking pictures of themselves in all different angles, all different places, and it wasn't even about where they were. It was just about them, and it says a lot about our culture. The Bible teaches us something different. The Bible teaches us about community. And one thing that's really amazing is that think about the New Testament. Think about, especially after Jesus had, had, had died and risen and gone back to the, be with the Lord, right? And now we have these people. We have Jews that have become Christians, and we have Greek that have become Christians, and people from all over the world have, have come to Christians. And now instead of being a Jewish church or a, a Greek Orthodox church or a, any kind of other church, it's it's. Christian church, and it's not just made up of one culture, but it's made up of many, many, many cultures. And so one Greek word, I believe, is sprinkled throughout the New Testament like, like salt on popcorn. It's used about a hundred times in the New Testament alone. And over half of the times is in the form of a positive command. So something good. Do something good, right? Right? What word could be so important that it's used by Jesus, that it's, that it's taught by the apostles, and it's instructed by the apostle Paul? That Greek word is alelon. Put that thing up there. I got another picture up here for you. Nope, I want that right there. You see it here? This is the, the, the right above this alelon is actually the Greek lettering. I can't read that, but that's what it is. Um, but that word says alelon. And it is, even though it's in one word in Greek, when we translate it to English, it's one another. And all throughout God's word is sprinkled with instructions for the church of how are we supposed to now interact? Because you know what? There's people from different cultures. There's people from different musical styles. There's people from different climates. There's people from all these differences in one place. And if it's going to work, they got to be able to love one another and bear with one another and be the church, be the example that Christ was for us. And so all throughout the New Testament, there's instructions for the church. Now, even though most of us in here are from America, not all, but most, we still are different in so many ways, aren't we? We all have different preferences. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different histories. We all have different likes and dislikes. And so these words, this word alelon is just as important for us. Because like one of you read that the people are going to know us by the love that we have one for another. And so if we want to impact the world, then we have to know what that means for us. You see, there's a, even though this word is used a hundred times, half of them in the form of positive commands, things like accept, admonish, be at peace with, be devoted to, bear or carry, be kind, be patient, be like-minded, build up, care for, be humbled towards, comfort, confess, consider, encourage, exhort, forgive, greet, honor, pray for, serve, speak truth, submit, teach, eat, and wait for one another. Of the 59 positive one another's in the New Testament, I kind of had fun just kind of breaking them down into kind of larger groups so that we'd have four Sundays to look at. And so, so I broke, the, of the 59, I broke them down into four groups. And you say, well, why, don't we, why are we not looking at the negatives? Because there's 41 or so negatives one another. I believe that if we're doing the positive one another's, 
we won't have any need to, to w wonder what the negative is because we'll be doing the right thing. And if we could just grasp in these next four weeks an understanding of what the church is supposed to look like, how we're supposed to be, and how we're supposed to love each other and admonish each other and serve each other and wait for one another, all these things, I think we can have a huge impact on our community and the world. But today, today we're going to look at the largest group of those 59 positives, and I broke them down into what we just called, we've been talking about already this morning, is love one another. And as I was looking at reading through all of these verses, I said, how can I, how can I put this into a sermon? Because we could just and read them, and that would be kind of cool too, but, but what do we learn? What do we learn when we're, we're reading through these scriptures about loving one another? And I found three things. I believe there are three relationships that God wants us to impact through loving one another. Three relationships that God wants us, the church, to impact by loving one another. The first one is our love for one another impacts the unbelieving world around us. Let's look at some scripture. John 13, 34 to 35 says this. You can follow me. We're going to be moving through some, chat, some verses pretty quick, but if, you, if you're a good uh, drill sergeant with your books, you can keep up with me, all right? Um, if not, you can read them on the Scripture, um, or I'll try to take some time in between to give you a moment. But this first one is John 13, 34 to 35. I know somebody's read this, but I'm going to read it again, all right? John 13, 34 to 35. And it says, a new commandment I give to you, this is Jesus speaking, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What do I learn from that verse? I learned that our love or lack of love for one another is one of our greatest evangelism tools. You know, we, we try to put together these nifty uh, theological scripts to go out and, and, and reach the lost, and those are good, but, but I believe our greatest tool that we have in the arsenal to reach the lost is the love that we have one for another. Because the world is in search of love. And they might not know Jesus yet, but they know you. They work with you. They go to school with you. They, they go to the gym with you. They go to the coffee shop with you. They, they're in your neighborhood. And they watch. Thank you, Jude. They watch. And if they see us biting at one another instead of loving one another, There's nothing here that they want. And let me confess, I am not always good at this. I have failed at loving my brothers and sisters in Christ at times. I have. Because we're human and we're selfish, and I'm selfish and human. And sometimes I think of my own needs first before the needs of others. Or maybe I feel fear or defense, and my defenses come up, and I feel attacked, and then I reach out in something that isn't loving. Can anybody else admit that in this room this morning? Amen. But you know what? We need to stop worrying about the color of the carpet, the style of the music, the preferences of what the coffee the little things that really don't matter. And you know what? Since I've been here at Coastal for 14 years, I think I have never encountered that here. That's why I love being here. I've been at churches where they've fought over the color of the carpet. And they've had business meetings and they got up in front and people were about to swing fists. I mean, it got ugly at times at business meetings. And I just was so confused. Is, is this what it's like? 
You know, I remember my first church out of seminary. I call it my desert experience. I made a lot of mistakes, and I learned a lot, and I, and I, I realized that ministry was not the romantic thing that I had in my head, that it was tough, and that sheep bite, and that pastors bite. We do. We do. And I had to come to the grips that if, if this is what I was called to do, that I had to get a little bit tougher skin, and I had to learn to deal with it, especially when I went being the music guy, right? Because you never pick the right song, it's never fast enough or slow enough or anything like that, or it's the wrong song, or I've heard it all, I've been there, I've done it, I understand, and I understand most time where it's coming from, but I also have been attacked because of a song, and it's just, it, it blows me away. That's not what, what's, the songs that we sing on here are not important. The love that we have for one another is important. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. At least I'm saying in the New Testament, so it's not hard for y'all. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers through Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. See, he said, everything that you do, people are watching because if, if we say God is love and Jesus loved us enough to die for us and because he loved me, he changed my life, but I'm not being loving to my neighbors or loving to my friends or loving to my enemies, then my words ring hollow to the world around us. So everything I do, even, even as I work with my hands, do it in such a way that people say, what's different about him you know, I, I shouldn't grumble about my boss. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be that kind of person. But yet times we fail. But those are the times we get back up. Those are the times we have for, ask for forgiveness. Those are the times that we are honest before those around us. The second relationship, so that first one I think most important, is the way we love one another impacts the world around us. People will want what we have if we have something worth wanting. They don't know Jesus, they see you first. And if Jesus isn't impacting your life, is impacting your love for people, then they don't want it. Number two, our love for one another helps in our relationships with other believers. So our first relationships with the world, the second one is with other believers. Turn with me, Galatians 5, Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 15, and this is one um, I have the, you know, the Bible app, probably many, many of you do, and I signed up for the verse for the day, and every day it sends me a verse, and in the middle of this week, as I was struggling with some really bad technical issues and worrying that we're going to get things ready for Sunday and working all the time and doing all kinds of things, this verse came up, and it was just God saying, I got you. We, we got this. Galatians 5, 13 through 15, it says this, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. I see a lot of times we think the church and the people writing the Bible were perfect people, but these churches had the same issues that we have because they're filled with sinful people just like our church is. But let me read that again. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And the word is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that, that, the whole law is fulfilled in that? That... That seems hard for me to believe. That if I love my neighbor, I'm making God smile. If I love the people around me, God won't be mad at me. There is nothing. God always challenges us to love more and more and more. 
Now, we always struggle with what the definition of love is and how that, that definition of, of tough love versus just weak, puny love. But, but I think you all understand that, that love has a lot of different things, but we are called to do it. And when we do, it says we fulfill the law. And if we don't, there's that little bit of that negative. We are consumed by one another. That's, that's not what I want. That's when you see churches fall apart. That's when you see churches that just dissolve because they aren't loving one another. Instead, they're biting at one another and fighting at one another until the church is consumed by that negative. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2 says this, Ephesians 4, I, therefore a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Like I said, we're, we're all different. We come from different generations. We come from different likes and dislikes, different past, different ex world experience, different life experience, different things that go on. But you know what? We're called to put aside those things for the sake of loving one another. You know, I know we sometimes gather in smaller groups of people that are like-minded, but when it comes to the church as a whole, if we're focused on ourselves and getting our needs met, then we're in the wrong direction. We've got to be focused on loving one another and serving one another and bearing with one another in love. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13 now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. That increasing and abounding in love for one another. Every week we see each other, we should be growing in love for one another. And that comes through being in God's Word and having the right spirit and walking in spirit together. And then this one that explains it all to me, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You know how I always kind of wrestled with that verse a little bit. What is it talking about? And, and this is the way I understand it. You know, when you, when you love somebody, when you really love somebody, like remember when you, like, you first started dating your girlfriend or boyfriend that maybe became your wife and you, you were passionately in love with them, you overlooked a lot of things, didn't you? Oh, it's okay. You know, that's, oh, it's so sweet they did that. That's great, right? And we do. When we love people, we, we allow them to be oh, less than perfect. We do. We allow them to have faults. We allow them to be human. But what happens when all of a sudden you don't like somebody? Every little thing they do, you don't like, and it becomes sin in your eyes, and you pick it, and you pick on them, and you point it out. That's what happens sometimes in relationships. When that, that marriage relationship falls out of love and, and grows towards hate, it just continues to go this way if you don't get out of that habit because what happens is you start picking at your spouse and looking at your spouse or all the things they do wrong and forgetting this verse that love covers over a multitude of sins. The only way, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we're going to be able to love each other like Christ wants us so that we can impact the world is that if we overlook some things from time to time. Now, that doesn't mean if we see a, if we see a sin in somebody's life that we don't go to them in love and confront them with that. But that also doesn't mean we sit there and we nitpick somebody on every little thing, right? Well, Robert, I'm not sure that song you picked this week was right. Remember my, my church, I think I might have told you this before, my, my first church out of seminary, my desert experience, I remember walking into a music committee meeting and they asked me, okay, Robert, why did you, why did you put this song here in the service? It's kind of slow. And we wanted something fast here. Well, it's not, 
okay, well, you, and then one of the ladies, one of the people on the team said, you know what would be perfect there? Um, it is well with my soul would have been perfect there. And that was a slower song than what I had picked. But you know what they said? Oh, that's right. That's good. Yes, 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 yes. Because it was the pastor's wife. And from then on, it was, it was you know, it was, it was nitpick, Robert, whatever. <laughs> whatever. I, I couldn't do anything right. You know, have you ever been in a relationship like that, that you just felt like you couldn't do anything right? It's because they've done this. If we love one another, we're going we're gonna to be okay that, that you're not perfect and I'm not perfect either. That we want to help each other get better and become more like Christ to take another step. But you know what? It, it's okay. You know, there was a, I don't know if you were here when Khalil was our youth pastor. You know, he and I were great friends. But you know what? At times, we got into some pretty good battles. At times, we did not agree with things, and, and we both let each other knew, no. But you know what I knew? I knew that he loved me, and I knew that I loved him, and that it would be okay. That we'd get over this, we'd apologize, we'd, we'd get back, and we'd get back at it, right? And that's okay. That's, that's part of that loving one another, bearing with one another, covering over a multitude of sins, right? The third relationship that our love for one another impacts, and this one really, this one really got me. Our love for one another impacts our relationship with God. Before we get to the verse, think about it this way, the simplest way I can think of. I have two children, Right? I've got two children there, really old now, 15 and 13, and the son has gotten taller than me, but 15 and 13. If, if there's someone, one of you, is like, let's say one of our church members comes up and says something nice to them or encourages them or, 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 or says to me a good word about them, you know what I feel towards that person? A greater love. Why? Because that person is loving my child. So by loving my children, it makes me love them more. And it kind, of, it kind of goes that way with God. When we love God's children, that's all of us that are believers, right? When we love God's children, I think there's something in God's heart that warms. And like Kenny says, it makes Jesus smile. And man, if, if, if I can do anything in a day, if I can make Jesus smile by loving someone, that's something I want to try to do. But, but let's look. Our love for one another impacts our relationship with God. Romans 13, 8. Romans 13, 8 says this. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. That's, and God's word says is when you fulfill the law, you're being obedient to God in your relationship with Him, Right? And so if we're fulfilling the law by loving one another, I, I believe we've taken another step and God loves us and God smiles when we love his children. 1 John 4, 10 through 12 says this, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. If we love one another, God abides. Isn't that what we want? We want God to abide in us to rest in us, to stay in us, to be perfected in us. And so what do we have to do? Know everything that we need to know about the Word? That's important. That's good. But it says here, if we love one another, God abides in us. And His love is perfected in us. You see, our relationship with God is about that. It's about relationship. It's not about knowledge. Knowledge is good and helps us to understand our relationship, but we have to have that relationship first. 
I wanted to read you something. And I'm calling this a letter to Coastal. And I don't want, I don't want you to look this up. I, I'll, some, somehow I'll put my notes up for you to see them. I, I apologize, I didn't get them in time to Kim to put them on the app, but I will get them up and you can have all these verses later. But I just want you to listen. First John, and I got to get back. First John chapter 3. Again, like I said, the, that John had this key theme running throughout his of love and loving one another. First John 3, 11 through 24. And where, where it has you or they or us, I want you to put you, your name personal, and for us, I want you to put Coastal in there. This is God's instruction, a letter to Coastal, and it says this. For this is the message that you, Coastal, have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment. Here it is. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ. And then what? So what's the second part? I told you not to read. Sorry. And love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abide in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And so it's simple. The church really is a simple thing. There's two commandments that we have been given in this New Testament church. Love God and love others. Love God. And there's a lot of things, you know, we could break down. That's what God's Word's here for, to teach us how to love Him and love Him more. And that's what we're looking at. The second part we're looking at right now in this month is how do we love others more? How can we reach out and love? And I always like to come back. And this is a principle that is in God's word. But then let's look at an example, right? Because, because who is our primary example? Jesus Christ. And so do you think Jesus was good at loving one another? And so I put, picked out a couple verses, a couple things that, that showed us an example of how Jesus loved one another. The first one we've, we've heard many, many, many times in sermons and lectures and, and books is Romans 5.8. It says, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved the world. <laughs> That even when the world wasn't perfect, he overlooked our sin because he loved us, but he loved us enough to die for us and create a way for us to deal with the sin problem in our hearts. But God chose his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then I want you to hear this really cool thing. You know, you could probably find lots of different examples of God's, in God's word of Jesus loving one another, but this is one that as I was studying, I hadn't thought of before. But it was an amazing how God, Jesus knew each and every one of them, the people that he came in contact with, and how to love them best. 
And this is Jesus' love for John the Baptist. Jesus' love for John the Baptist, and it's found in Matthew 11. And realize this, this is after that he had been baptized, John the Baptist had baptized him, they had gone their separate ways, John the Baptist had gone through lots of different things, and probably at this point he was in jail, okay? Um, and at this point, Matthew 11, it says this, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word to his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So how is that showing love to John? Well, let's think of that. John, the Baptist, in prison, going through difficult times, soon to lose his head, right? Soon to lose his head. He has spent his life expecting and telling about the coming Messiah. And now he's sitting in prison going, man, I, I baptized that guy and the, the dove came down and I heard, the, I saw the, the sky go up and it, it has to be him. But somewhere in the back of his heart and mind while he's sitting in prison, he has doubt. And can you blame him? He's sitting there in prison going, am I going to die for the right thing? Am, am I going to die for the true Messiah? Or am I just deceived? I mean, each and every one of us has to wrestle with doubt. But doubt that leads towards the Lord. And that's what John did. John said, listen, I'm not sure. So I'm going to send somebody to ask. And you know, Jesus could have been, could have just blown him off and said, ah, why is he asking? Doesn't he know? He baptized me. He saw the dove. What is he? I can't believe he's doubting me at this moment. I mean, Jesus could have had righteous indignation over this, but he didn't. And what did he do? Jesus quoted scripture that John would have known that was prophesying what and who and how the Messiah was going to be, how the Messiah was going to love the people around him. And so he says, hey, tell John this. You know the blind? They can see. Those guys that can't walk anymore, well, they're, they're running around now. Those people that have the spots all over them and the fingers are falling off, yeah, they're clean. People that can't hear, never could hear in their life, they can hear for the first time. And imagine this, people that are dead are now living. And you know what, this, this good news, this, these miracles, it's not just for the rich and the wealthy, it's not just for the religious Arist Aristotles, it's not just for philosophers, it's for the poor, it's for everyone. Go and tell them that. And so I can imagine John sitting in prison, receiving the news, and his heart being calmed, and his doubt being assuaged. And he felt the love from a Savior because he cared enough to answer his question. He cared enough not to get worried that he had doubts, but to give him the answers. Jesus was really good at loving one another. So what do we do with this? When we go into our time of of invitation, I want you to do a couple, one of a couple things. If, um, if there's someone, as I was speaking today, came to your mind, that somebody that you have not been very good at loving, maybe you've had a struggle with them, maybe you feel like they're your enemy. The Bible says we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against spirit, spiritual forces and principalities. So maybe there's somebody that you need to deal with and you need to maybe go apologize too. Maybe you need to write a letter. 
You know, maybe that person has moved on. Maybe it was a father or a mother who has hurt you. Maybe you just need to write a letter to them, even though they're not here anymore, and then file it away or burn it, whatever you want to do, but get it out. Let them know. Let God know. Deal with it because you know what? There isn't, there's, this is the time. This is the time that God wants you to make it right. You know, maybe there's somebody that's hurt you and, and, and you haven't done anything to them. Then I ask that you forgive them. And you don't have to go you don't have to walk up to them and say, hey, I forgive you, buddy. That does nobody any good. You just forgive them in your heart. And you release them from whatever you're holding on to them with. Those shackles that are not hurting them, it's only hurting you. Maybe you've never, the last thing, maybe you've never received the love of Jesus Christ. There's lots of people that are going to be, there's going to be our prayer team, our elders, there's going to be some people down here that would love to tell you about it, love to share their experience with God's love and invite you to start this journey. None of us are perfect. None of us love each other like Jesus did. But we can all try. And we can all strive to do our best. Coastal. Let's love one another, okay? We could do all the best programs. We could have the best music, which we don't. We could have, you know, the best tech. We could have huge TVs in the lobby, which we do now. We could have all this stuff. But if we don't love one another, it's nothing. Like a, a, a clanging symbol, the Scripture says. Let's love one another. And as we... As we look these next couple of weeks at all the many other one another things in God's Word, even though they're different words, they all lead back to this same truth, to love one another. We need to be patient with one another, submit to one another, cherish one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, all the many things that are in here. But we're going to break them down over these next couple of weeks. I hope you join me and uh, as we explore God's Word of how we're supposed to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into this place and we are so grateful. We are so grateful for your example of Jesus Christ, of how he loved us more than anything else. And that scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God, if there's someone in this room that has not accepted that eternal life, has not begun that abundant life that you have promised us. God, I pray that you would spark something in their heart. I know, I know it's hard to come forward, but, but maybe they can't do that, but, but I believe they can, but, but that they need to tell somebody, even if they can't come forward. This is the day. God, we want to be a church that's completely different. We don't want to just say we love people. We want to actually love people. And it starts by loving one another. God, help us to make right those things that are wrong. Help us to give somebody a hug that maybe we have thought bad things about or felt like they've attacked us or, I don't know, had a misunderstanding or maybe we just are different and have different likes and dislikes, God. Let us never put our likes in front of our love for one another. God, these are hard truths, but simple truths, just hard to do. Show us this week how to love one another more. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.